Welcome to the feature series, How Roger Penske Changed the Indy 500 on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, which celebrates the most successful entrant at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the 50th anniversary of his first event in 1969. Presented by Cooper Tires, the Justice Brothers, and Bell Racing Helmets, a longstanding partner of Team Penske, this 15-part series spans some of the greatest drivers, managers, mechanics, engineers, and the man himself, Roger Penske, to document the captain's vast influence on America's defining motor race, the Indy 500, and in many instances, the sport as a whole. We'll also be joined by a reporter who covered Penske's Indy debut a half century ago and some of his fiercest rivals, many of whom admit to being fans of the 82-year-old icon. Our guest on this episode of How Roger Penske Changed the Indy 500 is two-time Indy 500 winner Al Unser Jr., whose time with Roger Penske in the 1990s, including an unforgettable win at the 1994 Indy 500, marked the high point in a long and storied driving career. Al, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Roger Penske at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway this May. Thinking back to all that RP has achieved as an individual, all the team has achieved, your part in that success. Thought it'd be interesting to start on your thoughts about how RP has changed the Indy 500, how his ways of working, thinking, presenting, competing, just thoughts on how since he arrived that place has been altered somehow. Well, first, first off, thanks for having us and that kind of, of thing. And, and uh, you know, when you talk about RP, you know, it's uh, it's a fact that he he sets the standard in in IndyCar racing and has from the day that he showed up at Indy, you know, and from that day forward, and and so. Um, you know, when I'm growing up and I'm watching my dad and my uncle Bobby compete and at the Indy and, and watching just the, the whole picture going on, you know, um, I pretty much grew up with, with, um, uh, with Roger being at, at, you know, IndyCar racing with, with Mark Donahue in the beginning and, and that sort of thing. And, and really, you know the the Indy 500 is is the crown jewel of uh, American racing. Okay, you know, I mean, it was it was here long before stock cars were and that sort of thing. And and so um, to actually change um, Indianapolis Motor Speedway is saying a lot. Okay, and and so. When I think about what Roger did to actually change the 500, I think about the business model that uh, is in our racing today. And when I say that, I talk about sponsors. And Roger, Roger is like the car owners of the 30s and 40s, okay, where – they had a passion for racing. They loved racing, and that's why they did it. You know, unfortunately, they couldn't drive the car as well as the uh, a, a professional driver could, but they could own it. And when we start talking about, you know, the beginning of the Indy 500, it was all about the owner, okay? It wasn't about the driver. Mm -hmm. Like when Ray Haroon won the Indy 500, it was Marmon that was congratulated. The, 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 the driver was like a jockey in today's world. Okay. Where the jockey is, is the guy who rides the horse and, and, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I think the jockey should get more credit. Uh, okay? Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> I really do because, you know, they're the ones out there making it happen. And, and, like the race car driver is. And, and so uh, it wasn't until um, Tony Holman came along in the 40s that he started honoring the race car driver, okay? So 
when I talk about Roger Penske as an owner, not a driver at the Indy 500, what Roger brought was the business model of sponsorship. And he introduced that with Sunoco. Okay. And then it became a business model from that day forward. You had the Johnny Lightning special with, with Vell and Parnelli, you know, and, uh, and so on. And, and, you know, prior to that, it was STP with Andy Granatelli. Okay. But it was really Roger who took it the, the next steps, you know, I would, I would, I would virtue to say that, that 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 was the time that that it really became um, a business model that we in IndyCar racing today totally live by, you know. And so, um, in that aspect, you know, when you start talking about innovation, uh, competitiveness, clean race cars, you know, like like. Like Roger takes great pride in 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 the uh, the polished wheels sure. that that he brought to the speedway, which which is true. But that was that desire for innovation, for cleanliness, for for uh, uh, you know uh, the air jacks and so on. Roger did that also. That kind of of innovation desire for competitive edge was already there okay and and so which is the reason why the indianapolis motor speedway was built to begin with okay it was to advance the automobile and so the advances of the automobile had been taking place for a very long time you know and so um i don't think roger really changed that aspect of IndyCar racing, but he definitely changed the business model of how you go about racing. Now let's talk about standards of expectation and excellence. And before you drove for Roger, knowing your father's uh, involvement and engagement with Team Penske, your uncle's driving uh, career with them, long before you set foot into a Penske chassis, what did you see and observe here from your father and uncle about the culture within the team? What was expected? Everything I know is it was a very different team and environment. Um, my, my dad and my uncle, they, they had different, um, advice to give to me about Roger, you know, um, my dad simply said what we already knew is, is Roger just sets the standard and, and everything is uh, uh, the most advanced. Uh, gives you, Roger really gives you the tools to go out and do the best that you can do. On my Uncle Bobby's side of it, he just simply said, you have to stand up in the seat every time you drive in that car, mm. you know? And so, which means you have to win practice. You have to be P1 every time you sit in it. You have to be the fastest and set track records. Even when you're testing, you have to drive the car as hard as you can every lap that you're in it. And um, I think, you know, my dad wasn't that way. You know, my, my dad was okay. Um, it's, it's the philosophies of racing. My dad wants to win, lead the last lap and win the race. Uncle Bobby wants to lead the first lap because he wants to prove that he's the fastest guy out there, you know? And, And so it really shows in the mentality when they both gave me advice on driving for Roger. So you, in your IndyCar career, had already been fully established, fully successful. You were the man, the man to beat before uh, you came into driving for Roger Penske. Give me some impressions of being on track and racing against a Rick Mears, a Danny Sullivan. We can name so many others. 
but just the the Penske army that you were having to compete against in the 80s and even the early 90s. The old adage, uh, if you can't beat them, join them, <laughs> comes to mind, but you were beating them, right? So this wasn't a case of your career having not quite achieved that success. No, you had achieved that success. But before you went to drive for Roger, what was your mental impression of this competitive effort he put on track and the kind of obstacle it was to overcome it? Well, first off, honestly, I wished Roger would have hired me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, but but I seem to be in off years in my contract years with, you know, his drivers. Uh, not so much Rick Mears, but with his second drivers, Danny Sullivan and, and so on. And, and so... Um, it just didn't work out that, that, you know, it was later in my career that I, that, that I got to Roger, you know, to begin with, but I always wanted to drive for him, you know, and the reason why is because he sets the standard in, in racing and, and, and you see it with his, with his transporter, you see it with his hospitality, you see it with how many engineers when, when, when you really see it is when we're private testing at a track where no one's at and I would be testing with them and Rick Mears and I would be testing and we'd be the only cars out there. And when Rick Mears would finish a run and come in, there would be four or five engineers wow. talk to, talk to Rick, you know, when he'd come in and he's sitting in the car, he'd have multiple engineers when i would come in to the pits after my run i would have one <laughs> sitting on the a arm <laughs> sitting on the a arm and we're discussing things and and so that's really where you saw and felt the real difference of the the level of commitment that roger was able to do versus you know the the level of commitment that rick gallus and doug shearson were able to do, you know, we're, it was two different worlds, you know, completely. But, you know, because of the the cars that we drove, you know, that uh, that the Lola was very competitive with what Roger was building with the Penske on most of the years. There were those one-offs, okay, that the Penske was definitely – a better car than the March or the Lola that, you know, the, 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 the lower teams or lesser teams could go out and buy, you know? And so again, Roger building his own car, you know, um, really is, is one of the main reasons that I wanted to drive for him because that search for the mechanical advantage um, you knew where it, it rested. It's huge. It's huge, you know. And and when I'm when I'm in a Lola, I'm only as good as the other Lolas, you know. Now now, maybe, and what we strive to do was get our our Lola handling better than anybody else's Lola. Sure. Are the March handling better than any other marches? And by accomplishing that, we would step into that that area that we could outhandle the Penske too, you know? And, and so, uh, you know, those days were good. They, they were, they were satisfying, you know, when you could go and, and compete um, with all the different car makers and be able to uh, uh, have success doing that. Since 1954, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has served as the proving grounds for the world's most legendary helmet brand. From Jimmy Bryan to Mario Andretti and Elio Castroneves, Bell Helmets has and continues to protect some of the all-time greats. Follow the journey on social media at Bell Racing HQ or by visiting bellracing.com. So when it is time for you to join Team Penske, happens to coincide with a fairly magical year. Everyone, I believe thinks of 1994 first of the beast in Indianapolis mm -hmm. Motor Speedway. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in just a second. I think of it first 
with that Penske PC23 chassis, mm-hmm. which was just pure glory. It was, yeah. Tell me about timing. Had you landed a year later, boy, you would have been wonder, asking yourself about timing. <laughs> Contract, contractually, things did line up perfectly, but these things that you were hoping for, to have my own chassis, so this small number Penske cars that's really focused on the team instead of kind of a, a kit car available to, to everybody. Tell me about first test, first integration into the team culturally, what, would, what it was like, what was different there. Did it meet expectations of what your dad or uncle said you would find? Um, absolutely. It met all the expectations, you know, um, Roger at that time was building a super competitive car against the Lola and the, and the, and the March. What I instantly felt when I first drove, uh, the Penske was his shocks were by far, uh, in advance of anything that I had felt or driven before. And we're still talking about that today in 2019 of people wishing they could get a hold of that Penske shock technology. His shocks were, were by far, it was, it was a baby buggy. It was soft. It had a lot of grip, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's that, those were my very first impressions of the Penske was that, uh, it just, it was soft and, and when it needed to be stiff, it was stiff and, and that sort of thing. And so it really had a lot of grip to it, and uh, and so, you know, that was the '93 car that I was driving. Okay, because I joined the team at the end of the season of '93, and then the '94 car, it was really in the shock package that 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 really uh, uh, made that car really really good. What are you seeing and feeling within the team as you're getting to learn its ways of working, the general demeanor of the team? I've spoken with a couple people so far for this series. Outside, often the impression that it's a robot army. What was it like that at all? It was a race team. And, uh, and, you know, uh, at Penske racing, they have the same challenges and the, and the, and the same, uh, uh, obstacles that any other race team has. And, um, you know, I learned that straight away that, that once I got in and, and started really working with, with everybody, uh, it's just a race team. And uh, you have to work hard, and you have to think about it, and um, you have to go and attack it just like I would any other race teams. I just had more data, more information that I could work with. I could I could talk to I, if if I had an idea of what I think the car should be or or where it should go. I had three or four guys that I could run it by. And then they would talk, and then um, you know, then they would move forward in 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 building, if necessary, building a piece to accomplish. Okay, and so um, you know, it it is just another race team, though, and 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 I did learn, um, you know, that uh, that they're human. And, and, you know, they made the same mistakes that we made, you know, with, with our teams, with, with Gallus's team and, and Shearson's team. And, and, um, and so I understood why we could compete with them. Okay. Even though, you know, Roger, uh, provides all the tools, it's still, it is definitely not robotic it's it's not anywhere of the kind they work hard at their success and and so does Roger you know what what I loved about Roger when I was driving for him was he was involved heavily and so um it was funny 
he's so involved that when we first ran the 209 at Nazareth, when we first unloaded it, the beast. And we're he's looking at it, and and he's looking at the back end, and he's and he starts talking to the mechanics. He brings them over, and he goes, "We need some heat shielding here, you know, on the exhaust." I mean, and and I'm going, "Wow, Rogers." I mean, he's not into it. He's really into it. Okay, I mean, and and I loved it. That's that's what I wanted. That's that's. Uh, why I wanted to be driving his car where he was talking to me on the radio. And when I learned as I ran for him that first year, the information he gives the driver is by far more than I had ever experienced before. Hmm. And it was, it was like, wow, a race car driver is actually talking to me on the radio. And it's Roger Penske, you know, and he's given me information that I was, that I didn't know I wanted to know, but once I heard it, I'm going, yeah, all right, thanks, Rog. You know, I mean, kind of, that's what wow. my mind's saying. Now I've got a better picture of what the race looks like as I'm racing the race, as as if you were to take three steps back and look at a at a bigger picture. And that's what Roger does. Roger, Roger, um, and he's smart about it. You know, he's not just gibbering on the radio. He's giving you good, real information as you're driving. And he knows what you're going through, you know. It's funny, one day at the end of a race, we, we, we had a late yellow and, and we're leading the thing and and, uh, and we're getting ready to go green again. And he, he comes over the radio and goes, okay. Pace car shutting out of his lights, tighten up those belts, and let's get ready to go. And and I went, I checked my belts, and they were a little loose <laughs> <laughs> because it's at the end of the race, you know, and, and they stretch a little. And I went, oh, wow. He knew my belts were a little wow. loose. <laughs> so it was good. It was good. Let's talk about 94. It's obviously something that... I think will be celebrated as long as the Indianapolis Motor Speedway stands. I would imagine, Al, it was the perfect scenario you had dreamt of and wanted all along. Here is the race that means the most to you and your family. Obviously, you'd already won it once, but here you have something where clearly you have something special it's been a long time since a driver has woken up Sunday morning at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and felt that. I know I have something special that if I do my best, I can absolutely beat everybody today. How much of a dream is that? Is there excess pressure knowing that, holy cow, I actually have everything I've dreamt of? Maybe I could be the weak link. What's your mindset going into this? Yeah, the the mindset with with the ninety four Indy five hundred was um, the only people I have to race are my teammates. That's it. I knew that waking up that morning, uh, which is a great feeling. It's a feeling that I had never felt before because we, you know, I never had a car that was so strong you know, especially just down the straightaways. I mean, it's a, just a strong car that, that anybody could be driving, and it was going to be fast. You're you seeing know, numbers on the dash know, that are Rick, silly. Oh, yeah. Rick, you know, Rick Mears even made the comment when he first saw it that, that it almost brought him back out of retirement, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank God it didn't because he, he would have probably ended up winning that thing. But anyway, um it was uh, it was a dream come true. It was every reason why I always wanted to drive for Roger. The only thing that you can compare that 94 year to is when Andy Granatelli brought the turbine, okay, that first time, you know, with Parnelli driving it. And so, um, 
you know, that's the only other time that I can think of that one car had such a dominant uh, advantage over any other car in the in in the whole race, and and so, you know, they instantly brought rules against the turbine, and so, you know, I had a feeling that you know we were going to get by with it for the one year, but we weren't going to be able to 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 go any further than that. I you know because because you just you know the the advantage you can't have that and and so um so timing wise it was perfect perfect timing for me to uh to be driving for roger i just wished it hadn't been my rookie year with roger Mm. you know because with what the way things fell okay with um you know, us missing the show in 95 and then the split happening in 96. I raced, I, I drove for Roger for six years. I raced one Indy 500 for him in those six years. And so, you know, it's, again, it's just the way things fell, you know. And at the, at the most, I would have driven two wow. <laughs> out of the six years. You know, so you're looking at your fingers, you know, realizing there could be a lot more potential, a lot more rings. Well, I don't know about that, but you know, honestly, I just wished I would have been able to drive for Roger. You know, younger in my career, I wished I'd have gotten to him a lot sooner, and and I think, I think I would have won a lot more races. Yeah. Let's close on this, Al. So the basic theme of this series is to celebrate the team on its 50th Indy 500. Ask the question of how Roger changed the, has changed the 500 and just wander around some general points of interest. Let's close on how Roger has made an impact or changed anything within you. I know, obviously, towards the end of your time with Roger, wasn't the most competitive car was off in the wilderness a little bit developmentally. You've had some personal challenges. Rogers never wanted to publicize anything that he does to help folks, but I'm confident in suggesting that he's probably been long after you are one of his employees, someone who has had an impact and has remained present in your life. Absolutely. You know, Roger, um, Roger really, he, he did the most that, that I've seen and has his affected on me was how to face adversity. You know, when, when we missed the show in 95, that was the most adversity that I had faced at that time. And, um, you know, he, it was hard, it was hard and, and, and you take it, you don't run away from it. You don't shy from it. You embrace it and you try to make yourself better. And, um, as the years have gone on, you know, here we are in 2019 and that all happened in 95, I, Roger still a, a very big part of my life, you know, because we did share those moments together and and because of those moments and how we went forward in our lives uh, you know, I I think about, you know, when I come on adversity in in my life afterwards of Roger is, you know, Every every chance I get, I try to think about how would Roger handle this situation, mm. you know, and and um, it's one of of um, you know uh, respect, uh, intolerance, um, patience, you know. Um, it's just uh, you know try to see the whole picture kind of thing and, and, and have forgiveness, you know, 
Um, he's he is um, somebody who has truly been a instrumental figure in my life on how I want to be, and and so um, yeah, he's he's had a a, a big effect with me. And that was how Roger Penske changed the Indy 500. You can catch this series and more than 500 episodes at the brand new Marshall Pruitt podcast.com site. All brought to you by Cooper Tires, the Justice Brothers, and Bell Racing Helmets. <laughs>